is kernel debugging 432 and I'll go home here all right so like I say we've been working in user land all along we've been debugging programs that you run with your user account and now we're going to look at NTOS kernel which is the kernel itself and you can only do this with WinDebug so I'm going to bring here's my cloud machine and let's go to um, the kernel we can browse to it and view it it is a file on the disk like everything else the, of course the kernel that you're using is a memory image of this file it's running all the time you're using Windows but it was copied from the hard drive just like any other executable and it is here in C Windows System 32 and it's NTOS KRNL NTOS kernel.exe and you can examine this file for example with CFF Explorer and here if you go to the export directory you will see the functions it provides and you'll see there are some here that have no name but there are numbers so there are functions that can be executed but not by name then there's one called ALPC create security context and if you go down there are a lot of them hundreds CC add dirty pages to external cache and on it goes these are all the kernel functions available and everything your computer does ultimately involves calling some of these functions to do anything that touches the hardware so that's the what the kernel is just a big library of API calls so what if you want to do local kernel debugging you have to do some BCD edit commands in the command line and this is one of the things I wanted to test it does work in these cloud machines you have to do BCD edit debug on and BCD edit debug settings local BCD edit is the boot configuration data and it's binary now it used to be a file called boot.ini and this changes your machine to a different boot up mode then you have to restart it and this is restarting it with kernel debugging turned on which is not normally turned on because it uh, causes a slowdown in the, in the performance and also by the way it causes certain key presses there's a break key you can press and that will cause a kernel panic anyway so this turns it on and I've already done it on mine and restarted the machine and it worked so after that you can debug the kernel locally on this machine with WinDebug but you do have to of course run it as administrator for debugging the kernel and once you've got it going it's just file and attached to kernel is just one of the options and you can attach to a kernel on another machine that's connected by a serial cable or a network connection but if you're doing it locally you just go to the local tab and you don't have to do anything else because it knows right where the local machine is and when you give it OK it launches and now it's showing you information about the kernel that's running the machine we're, we're using right now so um, we can see the loaded modules with LM and there they are a few loadable modules notice these are things like WD boot and HW policy .sys, and they don't have symbols but here this does have symbols the PDB this is the kernel NT NTOS um, this is NT dill I think is what this is short no NT pardon me NT is short for NTOS kernel this is the kernel and it has symbols so we can refer to symbols inside the kernel easily and it, the glue link is clickable just like a web page if you click that it will show you uh, more information about them and it just executes this command L M D A V M N T so it shows me more information about what's in the kernel and in particular we could look at functions if I click that this is where you see the limitation of this GUI that is attempting to show you a usable GUI listing functions but it blithely goes about 50 pages long without telling you anything and the only way to use it is to scroll back and you can click on letters in the alphabet one by one to get another unusable display 50 pages long that you'll have to scroll back through so this is like I say uh, trying to take a command line tool and making it into a GUI is uh, not really enormously successful yet and by the way when you click 
that command to see the functions. Here's the actual command that it did. X, D, F, N, T, L, A, star, N, T, bang, A, star. And um, anyway, so now it's time. How would you learn to use this? In the old days, you had to do it all with command line commands. And as you can see, even with the new modern GUI version, you really have to learn these command line commands if you're going to get anything done in WinDebug Preview. So the way you learn it is right here, local help, the same way we've been learning it for decades with this chum file, Windows 3.1 help file. This is the ultimate source of how WinDebug works. For example, the X command is examine. And if you double click this, now it will finally tell you what the command does and what the command line switches are and even have examples and really be very, very helpful. This is where you learn how to use WinDebug. And if you know how to use WinDebug, you can see exactly what's happening in Windows all the way down to the kernel. And that's why there are features in Windows that are undocumented, but who cares? You don't need them to document anything because you can pretty quickly figure it out if you learn how to use WinDebug. So, you can unassemble a function with uf. So let's look at the nt create file function. So it's uf nt bang, which means it's in the ntos kernel module, nt create file. And that's the whole name of the function. So I can unassemble that function. And now I see the assembly language instructions that make up that function. It's a pretty short function. There's the whole thing. Here's the bytes that make up the command. Here's the assembly language. So this subtracts 88 hex from RSP, and that takes all those bytes to do. Looks like maybe 8 or 10 bytes. Then there's an XOR and a move and so on. And at the end, there's a return. So that's the whole function. And really, all it's doing is setting something up and then calling a lower level function called IOP create file, which is often the case. All of the many of the functions that you call are, in fact, just little shells that rearrange the parameters and call a lower level function. Which is also true, as I mentioned before, of the kernel itself. If you write code, your code will import and use kernel 32. And all kernel 32 will do is relay out the parameters and call the native kernel, which will then call NTOS kernel, which will then go to the hardware. So it's uh, that's the natural flow of things. And most developers don't know or care about anything down here. All they care about is kernel 32, just using the functions there. And this is all up to Microsoft, and you just let Microsoft handle it for you. But if you're a hacker, you, you break the chain of flow, and malware just jumps down to the native API and so on, breaking the official rules. All right, so we did loaded modules, and we did help. And we looked at how to unassemble a file. And now we can search memory. So we can search starting at nt bang nt create file and then you can tell it um, how far to search i'm going to search for 100 bytes with l100 and then i'm going to search for this sequence of bytes 0x44 0x24 0x40 all right and it didn't have to hunt too far. It found it here at that location. See, there are the three bytes I was looking for, 44, 24, 40. So you can find a pattern of bytes. Now, I tried doing your project um, that we did with Ollie Debug here, where you take um, putty and you find reference text strings and change them. And it was just awful to do it in WinDebug. I think you really have to be an expert at all these command line commands to get it done. Uh, Ollie is not going to replace Ollie in my book anytime soon. But when you want to work in the kernel, it's your only choice. So you can search for strings with S minus SA. This will search for ASCII strings in NT, bang, NT create file. For kernel debugging, what is the starting point? How to know which function? Well, um, what I would normally do is start by defining what task you're trying to do, and then use something like API Monitor or Breakpoint to see what calls it uses. That's probably how I would start. Like we did that for the uh, RDP client and for Notepad. So you could see what calls it was making, and then you'd know which function. That would probably be a good way to start. Another thing you can do is you can look for functions that are put there by malware. At least you used to be able to. But in modern versions of Windows, Microsoft has pretty much ended kernel hook rootkits. They used to modify the lookup tables in the kernel 
to make rootkits, and you could just look for unusual numbers in that table. But I think Microsoft has pretty much ended that with their modern defenses. But these are very good questions. And what you really do is you're exploring a whole world. So um, what I do is I follow like blog posts and stuff that show you how to do a particular thing so you can learn uh, skills that other people have already figured out and textbooks and stuff. And that's where you start. And after you've done the stuff that's in textbooks and blog posts, then you can start doing your own research. So this is going to search for ASCII strings. And there it finds ASCII strings. This is the equivalent of the strings command we've been using before, looking for readable strings. And as you see, there are none of them that really look like they're readable strings intentionally here. They just look like they're random bytes that happen to be readable. All right. And here's another one. Um, and this is going to specify the length. So it's S minus bracket L6 bracket. And I had to use, of course, the help menu to figure out how to do this because it isn't very obvious at all. NT create file L100. This is going to do the thing looking for strings, but only ones of length 6 or more. And the only one was this SVWA thing, which I think is also just random junk, but at least it's longer. You can also display memory. If you display both at NT, then it will dump memory in both hexadecimal and ASCII. And here's the start of NTOS kernel. And this should look familiar. This is the way every Windows executable file starts, with MZ to mark the start. And with this message, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. That's the legacy. MS-DOS header that's in every executable. Now you can examine a data structure. We're going to look at a file object. Everything in Windows is an object. DT NT bang underscore file underscore object. All right, and this will give us the file object data structure, which is used to refer to files, to do things like open files for reading and writing. And here it shows you what it is. It has an int 20, a size, a device object, context, and how long they are. This is a data structure. And here's counting through the bytes in it of storing all the data that is, uh, refers to a file. And there are permission objects, read access, write access, delete access. These are um, single byte uh, permission objects that tell you what you're allowed to do with that. All right. You can view processes with dot t list. This will be the current task list. There they are. Many processes running. Runtime broker and SVC host. And somewhere in here will be the debugger I'm using. Your phone.exe. That's probably trying to connect to an Android phone, I would guess. Start menu experience host. Anyway, those are all the running processes. And you can learn more about one process with bang process 00. And then the name of a process like lsass.exe, which is a Windows process that's always running, the local security authority. And it tells you more information about it, including the parent um, process ID and the process environment block location, which uh, is a place where information about processes is stored. And you can run dev node to see devices and drivers, bang dev node 0, 1 disk. And this will give us information about the physical disk object. So a blue address for the PDO. Yeah, this is the physical disk object's location. Um, all right, which is a uh, another data structure. And if you click the blue address for the PDO, it will tell you what kind of disk you're using which in my case was a VMware disk. And these cloud machines, it might be something different. Auto generator, security descriptor, um, Canon, canonical product virtual IO. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what I'm learning anything new. Auto generated name. Yeah, it's not as obvious. For mine, it had some readable stuff that made it clear it was um, a uh, VMware drive. So anyway, there's a few things where you're looking in the kernel, just a beginning introduction, and there's many, many other things you can do. But that gives you some of a clue how people figure out uh, 
what's inside the kernel and develop uh, kernel mode malware and find kernel mode bugs.